welcome back to another episode of the Cardboard Herald, my chance to talk with creative gamers and game creators. And today I'm joined by Janice Turner of Ren Games. Welcome to the show, Janice. Hi, and uh, yeah, thank you for having me on. Yeah, of course. This is really cool for a lot of reasons. One, we are on separate continents, so that's nice. You just had dinner and we're watching movies with the kids. And I'm here in Alaska and I haven't even had lunch yet. So that puts us on different clocks, so to speak. And uh, hopefully you're not uh, hungry and I'm not over full. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. that that works too. So uh, I guess... Some of the things that I wanted to talk about today were just the, your overall trajectory with Ren Games. So this is a company that's comprised of both you and your husband, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, just okay. the two of us. Okay, just the two of you. And you're both game designers, or do you separate the the job duties within the company? Tell me about your structure. Um, I Generally, how it works is that um, I sort of, go to as I'm going to sleep and uh, the kids sort of slightly keep me, me awake or for whatever reason and I somehow need to dream up a game I then bounce ideas off my husband Stu he sort of says oh this doesn't work that doesn't work they try and get it to the table um, I play test it a number of times until I'm reasonably happy with it and then sit down with Stu and we go through it so I guess I'm more doing the design and he's more the developing and he basically says, this is rubbish, this is rubbish, this is rubbish, and uh, this could be better. Have you tried this? Have you done that? What about this? Um, rips about 60 to 70% of it out or changes it. <laughs> and then we go to the cycle again. That sounds really cool, especially the whole like going to sleep yeah. and then having a brilliant moment where you're like, aha, this is going to be the game that we're going to work on. Yeah. It's like, uh, I think I read a story one time where Keith Richards was talking about how he would keep a, a like tape recorder next to his bed. So that way, if he woke up from a dream with a song in his head, he could just record that thing. And sometimes he would go to it in the morning and not realize how much he recorded in the night before. That could be all apocryphal or you know just building up the mythos of keith richards but in your case i believe it so was assembly one of those games that came to you in almost a fever dream yeah it was it was literally i was um on maternity leave with my eldest and um it was in she was a few months old and just sort of getting interrupted sleep and that side of things and i've just started the there was a board game geek design contest at the uh, mint tin and I thought well it'd be fun to try and enter something into it and it'd be something to do in a short time and that um, I would complete because it needed to complete for the contest Um, and essentially just as I was going to sleep I was trying to think up an idea and I played clock patients loads as a kid and I loved that sort of circular layout I hadn't really seen it before and then I just started thinking about I loved that what could I do with it and as I was sort of in this half sleep half awake thing I sort of came up with the idea of trying to get the modules onto the right cards and then sort of prototyped it up early the next morning and it, it seemed to work so um, it was sort of like 40 percent there from going to sleep to a couple hours in the following morning um, we had a sort of the bare bones mechanic of a game to start working and when was this? Uh, that was a couple of years ago because she, well, she's now, she's coming up four. So it probably be about, about three years ago, three, four, three, three and a half years ago oh, that man. we did that. Yeah. <laughs> and then you did a Kickstarter not too long after that, right? I mean, your Kickstarter. I did it when I was on maternity leave with, with my second. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you can mark the trajectory of Ren Games based off of the delivery of children. Yeah, I have no plans for any more children, though. <laughs> okay. Well, hopefully many more games than children. Yes, hopefully, yeah. Um, but, yeah, so um, I, I, I went back to work after that one. Um, sort of, it all got a bit forgotten about. And then thought, well, I've got maternity leave coming up again. It would be nice to actually get something published. And although I could sort of go with publishers, I like the idea of the challenge of doing it ourselves. So my background is project management and product management. And sort of always been sort of encouraged to develop ideas and perhaps start my own business up at some point. And um, I thought, well, this would be a chance just to give it a go. It's Kickstarter's relatively low risk in terms of you're determining that there is a market first. I mean, there's always the risk that you completely get it wrong. If it doesn't fund, you know there's not a market for your product and therefore you know not to go any further. And other than losing some time and um, perhaps some sanity, you, you know that actually 
I shouldn't continue. So we thought we'd give it a go, and it was really interesting. Um, it was a slight, it was a different industry. It was quite a shock at how different the industry was because I work in engineering, and so just sort of the the, the difference in the way things were done were, was quite. Quite yeah, was, I was used to like really really formal agreements with absolutely everything, and although you need to specify everything pretty clearly, it was it just seems a lot more informal than I was used to, which was um it was yeah it's a really just interesting learning experience that I really enjoyed, and uh, I almost enjoy the business side of it as much as I do the designing side. Well, that's like the game player in you. I mean, so much uh, about game playing is about efficiencies and strategizing and, you know, coming up with unique approaches. And I think the, the business management there, there's there's a familiarity there at very least. But the, the Mint Tin competition that you were doing, the, the design competition on BGG, how did you fare in that? I did pretty well. We um, got third for most innovative mechanic, uh, got best written rules, and we came about fifth or sixth overall out of 20, 30 in entries. So given that we was, re- I was well, relatively new to board game geek as well um, at the time, so I'd like used it but not really participated on there very much. Um, yeah, I think we did reasonably well for a, a first timer. What do you think the the main value of participating in that contest at that moment in time as being a relatively new board game geek user, being a new designer uh, who's uh, approaching this? Like, what did you most gain out of it? I think it's probably confidence because you get people to um, actually look at your design and everyone there is willing to do playtesting and you get to playtest other people's as well so you get to see what other people are doing too but then just the confidence that actually it's not a load of rubbish actually you're, de- you're designing something that at least someone out there is enjoying it and it's not you and it's not someone just being polite for being polite's sake so it, yeah I think it's, it's a confidence that um what we, what, what I was doing or what, what we were doing was um was okay it wasn't it wasn't rubbish it wasn't a complete pile of garbage I guess I didn't get into your history too much. You mentioned that you were a new board game geek user, so maybe you weren't as immersed in the modern hobby tabletop gaming scene up until that point. Like, what were you playing in advance of this? You know, what was your experience with like a broad variety of modern games? So uh, I was not not necessarily a new user, but I was a new in terms of interacting on the forums and that side of things. I see. So I, I see. yeah, I was, I was sort of familiar with it and sort of would use it for looking up games and stuff here and there and see what's going out. But I didn't really work on have much interaction on the community side. But in the lead up, I was playing things like um, Pandemic, Flashpoint, um, Forbidden Island, uh, Forbidden Desert was actually got first rather than Forbidden Island, uh, Zombicide. I'm trying to think what else, what the other guys, Dominion. Um, right, right. A yeah, lot of those are co-op to. games, which makes sense given that you so far have been focusing on co-ops. Do you feel strongly that like cooperative gaming is is like a, a, a favorite type of games to you? Or were those just some of the early examples of games that you guys got into? I'd say 19 to 95% of our games are co-op, co-op or solo. So, uh, yes, um, essentially we don't really, in, we mostly play games two-player and um, when they get competitive, it can be quite brutal and I play <laughs> to win and my husband plays for fun, which right. means that uh, it, it can get a, a little bit hairy. And um, I just sort of started refusing playing competitive because it just wasn't a fun experience because if I, was play- if I, I wasn't allowed to play to win kind of thing, it just sort of sat the fun out of it for me. Whereas it also me playing to win sat the fun out of it for him. Um, so uh, he always uh, thought that it was, um, to start with, it was my dislike of competitive games and that I was just too competitive. And then about a year ago, he said, actually, I realized that I don't like competitive games. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I think it's with two player, it's a very, very different dynamic. And we, we have a few, uh, like we've got Terra Mystica and a couple of those, but they rarely ever hit the table now. And it's it's got to be something where it's just um, a bit of fun if it's competitive. So where it actually winning doesn't matter. So like Towers of Arabian Nights, where it's just an experience mm-hmm. and actually I think we've only ever finished like one game of it. We just like would play it until we'd had enough, and it was like, oh, that was a fun. Now let's put it away, and let's that, that's it. We're done with it because it just like takes a, takes ages, and the wing conditions are a complete load of rubbish. Yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. 
but it's a really fun sort of experience. Um, so yeah, we pretty much only play cooperative and we enjoy that because um, we both relatively go from the gut um, as well when we play, but I sort of play a bit more to win and Stu plays a bit more um, just sort of what's happening now without the planning. So I, I guess it kind of, we bounce off each other really well in like that sense. Right, right. I was having a Twitter conversation with someone recently about how it seems like we're not just in the golden age of board gaming, you know, that term is thrown around all the time, but just it, it's incredible looking at the landscape of cooperative games and the, the huge amount of variety within cooperative games these days. I mean, it used to be that there were... I guess, pandemic and things that were trying to be like pandemic. And now there's just such a breadth of mechanics and play styles and so many different approaches and themes. Like you could spend your entire tabletop gaming career just playing cooperative games and never run out of cooperative experiences to have. And now you are putting your mark on that with Assembly and Sensor Ghosts. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, as I said, pretty much all of our collection is cooperative and we seek out them. I've started a while ago, I created a list of sort of the cooperative games that we've played and how much we like them. Um, it's kind of fallen a bit way by the wayside, but there, there's tons of them out there and they are so different. You've got mini ones, you've got puzzles, you've got ones that are more Euro, you've got ones that are more Ameritrash, you've got pretty much every um, different genre and theme under the sun that you could do so yeah it's definitely something to suit everyone and some play it better at low play counts some at better high play counts and um but i think the most of them do tend to play better at sort of three to four players um and they're a lot harder at the the two player one um which is kind of where assembly and sensor goes comes is that uh, our inspiration, are you familiar with um, the Shady T- Torby's uh, Oniverse games? So Sylvian, Nautilian, yeah, Onarim. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So they are basically our inspiration for the sort of the packaging, the way, the thoughts behind them. And that they're a not too long game, um, that they're in a small box, that they've got lots of variety, and that they're low power account and they're cooperative. And we absolutely love those games. And they're sort of the ones that if we go on holiday, those are the ones that go in our suitcase all the time. Um, and they've got a really sort of, they always have sort of quite a stunning art on them as well. And they're just, they're just, just right, really. And they're, they've got, they, they fit a need, I think. I don't think there's enough games like it. Which is why when sort of assembly came up in the Mint Tin Design Contest, it was like limited in terms of fitting it in the tin, which kind of to a certain extent limits length as well, is just how it all came about and um, yeah I think there should be more sort of low player count cooperative short but fun thematic games at any point was assembly or sensor ghosts entertaining the idea of having additional player counts beyond two uh no it's only really recently as in the the last couple of months that we've entertained it um, so we have like, was told by retailers for some of them that all one to two players, it won't sell well kind of thing. Um, but I, at least one of them is completely bucking the trend that they're, like, they're doing really, really well with assembly. And the fact that it is low player count seems to be going in its favor. But, um, yeah, we did actually last night we tested a three player variant of assembly and I'm pleased to say it worked and we lost, <laughs> 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 which is good. <laughs> which means I've got the deck probably about right. It might be one card out, I think. And that's what it always comes down to is, it, is do I put that card in or do I not put that card in? How much of a challenge do we we, we, ha- we put in for it? But um, yeah, it, it worked. It requires two base games, um, but you're basically building the ship twice, but simultaneously. And there's interactions between the two rings. Um, and I don't know how well that will, that will go down and be taken because... Are people looking for 10 to 20 minute, or I guess it'd be 20 to 30 minute, three to four player games that are a puzzle? I mean, there's plenty of other games out there, and are we competing? But in the one to two player, I think we've got a bit of a niche. So I guess time will tell. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't really take much from us other than a, an additional rule book. And then um, two, set friends, two sets of friends with assembly can come together and play all together rather than separately, which would be uh, hopefully a bonus. Yeah, and, you know, the the one to two player thing, it may be limiting in some regards, and, you know, maybe you are, 
I guess, alienating a market of people who want the flexibility to be able to play at higher player counts. But also, I know that there are a lot of two-player games out there that are... I guess, uh, reinterpretations of existing Euro games that are more flexible. You know, you have things like Caverna Cave versus Cave or Duelist or Island, those types of things. And what I really like about them, or, or um, I, I guess uh, Seven Wonders Duel is another example. And what I like about these games is that you can make considerations that are, are much more finely tuned that that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do because the flexibility would add too many factors. You know, if this game can go up to five players or seven players, like why was Caverna ever, ever (laughs) thought to be played at seven players is beyond me. But, you know, having these tight confines, I think lets you make a game that's unique compared to a lot of things on the market, which have to make, I I guess, um, considerations that, that allow it to scale to that degree. Yeah, it's, it's also really the I can say the development time because you've got the testing at every single the different player counts and then having people that are not you testing it at those player counts as well. And the more people you have, the the harder it gets. Particularly where we are with with two young children, I don't actually get a huge <laughs> amount to go and see other board game people. So it's I'm I, I'm quite limited. So um, it's normally me and my hubby sort of doing it. So it gets really thoroughly tested at solo, and it gets pretty thoroughly tested at two player. When it gets to three player, the level of play testing will go down, and it'll be mostly like me playing three hands or me playing two hands and Sue playing one hand and that sort of thing. And then it's um it means that the refineness of the game probably isn't as good, so it's not as good an experience. But I guess most games, they have an optimum player count. Um, and it's just, we know where our limits are at the moment of what our optimum play count is, and it, it seems to work. But I, I'm quite I'm quite pleased with the three player. I managed to do it for Sensor Ghost as well. And it's something we might be able to refine sufficiently. It's literally, as I said, we're down to like a, a card or two. Um, but with the UK Games Expo coming up, I'm hoping that we'll be able to get groups of three players to just go through it and get a huge number of play tests in over the conference week or the con weekend and um, put back any feelings that it's not sufficiently good in the good. I always sort of worry that it's uh, uh, it's not refined enough because it's sort of being considered like because of how tight it is. I don't want to let people down and put something out that isn't as tight. And that's kind of like my, the worry in the back of my head, even with Sensor Ghost as well. Is it as good as Assembly was? Because it's been very well received so far. So let's actually talk about Sensor Ghost because that's the game that's right on the horizon. The Kickstarter is here at the end of May, right? Yes, 28th of May. So we're doing something which is either foolish or brave or we'll find out in a six weeks time i guess we'll call it <laughs> brazen split the difference yeah. so yeah so we are so um yes so whether it's um foolish or not we'll find out but we're um doing a, a combined kickstarter for an expansion for assembly which has two new game modes so it's like a double expansion for assembly um, which we might then put in the rules for the three and four player as well. So you could say it's more like a triple expansion. <laughs> um, and then we've got Sensor Ghosts as well, which is a completely separate game, but thematically it follows on from Assembly. So for us, theme is really, really important in our games that we like to know why we're doing something and to try and make it intuitive that you're doing this because of something. And um yeah, so it, it thematically it follows on, and it's so uh, assembly is building a spaceship to escape, and Sensor Ghost is navigating through uh, a meteoroid storm back to Earth, um, and trying to survive whilst the computers hacked to your systems. First off, I love the theme. Second off, I love the name because it sounds like it could be a sweet prog rock album. And third, <laughs> <laughs> I love the focus of these games. So. Can you give just like a, a nutshell of what Sensor Ghost is for someone who's just listening to this podcast because it's, you know, the next Cardboard Herald episode for a little bit of context that may make someone interested in checking out the Kickstarter? How does the game play? Uh, so, number one, um, when you go to the Kickstarter page and you look at the rule book, you'll see there is story littered throughout it. 
So that's the first thing. It's really good to have a look through that and I'd advise read that first, get a feel for what it's about and then read through the mechanics. So in terms of what it is, you're trying to navigate from the space station back to Earth, but there's a um, meteoroid storm and you need to collect a virus sample en route because you are potentially infected and Earth is not letting you land. So what you've got to do is... Um, navigate through it which sounds really simple so you've got a grid of cars which are five by seven and and you've got to go from the bottom left hand corner up to the top right which sounds really dull however as you move it's not the top of the car that matters it's the bottom and so the cars are all double-sided and what's on the back isn't necessarily the same as what's on the front there's maybe like a 40 percent ish probability that the back and the front are the same but when i say the same i mean the same category as in bad or not too bad <laughs> so, so i like, like that broad like, range there so, so there's like a, a a absolutely fine um it could be fine or it could be awful there's um it depends if you've got your shields up or not so again it could be fine it could be awful and um insta death so what's on the back is um you don't you don't know but there are various ways for you to look at it so there's a little bit of memory involved but neither Stu and i like memory games so we've tried to mitigate that as much as possible and for the bits where you do have to remember, there are a couple of cubes and various things that you can do to try and minimise the memory aspect. But yeah, you, you literally you've got to navigate through a hidden maze that's moving, constantly moving with um, various effects that can shoot you forward without expectation um, and get to the finish line um, using a limited set of cards in your hand. In the two-player, there's a bit of programming as well. So you, um, we did limited communication in assembly. And the idea there was to try and get around alpha player side of things. Um, that was really the core reason for including it, because otherwise it just becomes a solo puzzle with someone else just dealing some cards in. The Janus side of things. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do try to restrain myself. <laughs> Yeah, it, it can become very much that, which is why we put limited communication. That's our solution to sort of the alpha player, and we have that in um, Sense of Ghost as well as an optional. So it's a programming in two players. So you're both playing cards face down, and so you again the same thing. You mustn't reveal your hand as in assembly, but there's a little bit freer communication in how much you talk. But when you put your cards face down, you don't tell the other person what you're playing, and you can't see until you reveal it, and then you can cooperatively decide how to which ones to do first and which ones to do second based on what's been put down. So it's just to try and stop that forcing of one player to, for the other one what to do because you don't know what they're doing and you can't see what they're doing and it sort of takes that edge off that I must do what the person over there says because they, it's too late then, you can't change your mind because once it's down, it's revealed, that's it. Um, so yes, it's, it's a bit of programming. You put it you, you in the two player, it's quite different in terms of you're doing two cars a turn around, whereas in one the one player, and what is a three player, it's a single card to turn. Um, so it's a little bit of programming as well, um, but only a little bit, a hint of it, with, as I said, limited comms as well. And how long has this game been in development? Like, did you already have notions of a sequel to Assembly in mind while you were getting the Kickstarter going for Assembly? Or was this something that you kind of wrapped that up and then you were like, oh, I think we have something here. And was it always both a thematic and kind of a mechanical sequel to Assembly? Uh, quite a few of the people, or the backers from Assembly, said it would be really nice to see a sequel in the, sort of the, the, the next stage of it. And it, that's really what got me thinking about what it could be. And I just thought, well, okay, so how do I do a sequel? So it's going to be about a journey, is the most bit thing. And then that's how that one came about, sort of lying in bed. Well, there's a journey. How can we do a journey that, that is something that isn't just another game of moving around a board um, or a set of cards. So yeah, it wasn't planned. Um, it was a result of a number of people saying, we'd like to see a sequel. And the fun that we had and Assembly being um, far more successful than we thought it was going to be was um, hoping, <laughs> with our fingers crossed and toes crossed, that maybe we <laughs> <spend. laughs> That was sort of our expectation. If we did, it would be maybe squeaking through. Um, but yeah, so we, th we thought, yeah, we'd like to do the next one, and it, it fitted. So I had another game that I was planning to do next, but it was like a 60-minute cooperative that was probably best at about three players. Um, and it wasn't quite there. I was in a bit of a, a hole with it. And it's also I just couldn't get the time to play test it. With two, two young kids, it just becomes 
near impossible. And so I, I joke that these are nap time games because I play test them in nap times <laughs> and people can play them in nap times. So they are ideal for new parents or parents of young children um, or <laughs> anyone who's short of time. And that's kind of where it is. And I thought it worked pretty well last time. It's It fits in with our lifestyle. And maybe I'll go back to what's called the Maiden Voyage at some point in the future when I've got a bit more design under my belt and maybe able to do it more quickly. But I think I'm much more in favour of the, the shorter games now. And that's now got me thinking about the third one, which I already have a mechanic that was going to be in a bigger game, but I'm thinking maybe actually packaging it into a smaller game instead would be uh, much better, which could be perhaps the third in the series. Nice. But yeah, so it's been development, I guess, maybe... N- nine-ish months uh, on and off but I guess it was Christmas where the development actually sort of really ramped up and sort of made making a lot more changes and spent a lot more time focusing on it well if you make nap time games I make nap time videos and I only have (laughs) one four-year-old to deal with let alone no younger kids around here so I, I commend you for the amount of productivity to have jobs and game designs and businesses and kickstarters and all of that going on at the same time as far as the actual design itself what was the most challenging thing to work through i think the challenging thing was um well when you're programming it, it involves a lot more in sort of the, the hidden information side of things so you always have to play you play them by perfection because I can see both hands when I'm sort of doing that, the, the very sort of the lots of regular, the play testing. And so I'm playing to perfection and then I end up making the game too hard because I'm trying to do it to the point of me, who I know knows the game extraordinarily well with perfect information and then expecting people to try and to be able to win the game with imperfect information and, and lack of knowledge of the game. So I think it's, it's all about that, where to put the balance where to say actually this is about right which is why i always put increasing and decreasing difficulty in the games anything i chuck out and play testing i write down as a way for someone to scale the game to meet them because you also you've got if someone's more technically or mathematically minded they will possibly do better than someone that isn't or just if the, the game clicks with them and so how do you still make it as a challenge for them but where do you actually draw the line and say this is my deck because it's a puzzle and it's all about the challenge. You want people not to win every time, but you want them to get close. And so it's a really, really fine line, really hard to get it just perfect. And it's also, it's a, a delicate balancing act in trying to make the player feel validated, right? Because like if you are playing, say, Forbidden Desert and you are having a really hard time on normal mode, and then you scale it back down to like easy or beginner for a certain player that may be like, I have no vindication in this win. Like I, I, this isn't a real win if I won on easy mode. Uh, So being able to still make it it validating for the the player themselves that they um, had a good experience and felt like they had the, the the challenge that they were trying to get out of the game in the first place. I so my, my aim is that you will either lose with about no more than about two turns, maybe three turns to go, and you should win with no more than preferably one to two turns left that you could have sort of uh, could have done based on the cards. That's sort of my my aim is that most people will fit into that category and they're going to have a few extremes at either end, but that's kind of where I want to be. Um, I'm getting a deck that's of sixteen cards in assembly. Um, and it's 30 cards and sense of ghosts it makes it yeah it's um quite quite fine-tuned one of the biggest challenges of cooperative games that i see is maintaining tension throughout the game and i i think one of the biggest or most notorious examples of a game that doesn't maintain its tension through and through is one of my favorite co-ops and that's spirit Island. You know, it's a game where you get about three quarters of the way through and you know, if you are going to win this or not, and then it becomes an act of actually finishing it out. And there are many co-ops that have done better jobs at maintaining that tension through. In fact, I think forbidden desert is one of those examples Mm -hmm. of games where it really is kind of a nail biter all the way to the end. And it doesn't feel random or haphazard or like you just failed purely out of dumb luck, but it, it does 
feel like at, at any moment any everything could go soup sandwich and then all of a sudden you 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 are spinning out of control what did you do in this game in order to make sure that it it remains tense throughout and like uh there there is no clear sign that you have made it over the hump and now you're just coasting to victory um in the in sense ghosts um at the beginning you had no information and so all about the beginning is about working out and finding out about the environment around you and then as you start moving through you realize that you've just spent a huge amount of the deck um finding out about your environment around you and um you don't have much of your deck left and if you run out of cars basically it's game over you've run out of fuel you don't get back to earth um and so then it comes to the point of well when do i take risks and it's 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 a certain amount do i take risks are they educated risks are they uneducated risks and if you take too many uneducated risks or quite often if you take one you're probably going to lose um however you do need to be much more careful and suddenly there's this like a switch in the game about actually you know what i've just got to go for this i'm pretty sure i know what's there and i remember what was there and um I, I just need to go and so it goes from the beginning this sort of slow pace of finding out to the end sort of saying I, I'm almost out of time I've got to find something I've got I just got to get that otherwise I know I'm going to lose and with sort of uh, one of the cards which is like a boost card um, which is basically your, your engine's misfiring um, it can be absolutely lethal because it can like, send you off the edge of the board or it can send you into something deadly but if you get it lined up just right then it can just boost you pretty much all the way there. So you can go from like two thirds of the board up to sort of the 80% way mark or something in the say, in sort of one foul swoop. And so it's, it's that's how is there is this um, lack of information to knowing you're running out of time. It just changes the pressure between the two that you're sort of too fearful at the beginning. And at the end, it's about when to, t- when to go and when to, when to play it completely safe. You mentioned that you are very focused on theme, like theme is important to you. Story is clearly important to you. And why this theme and story? Are you just like a a big sci-fi nut and you just love, (laughs) I I don't know, you know, 2001 Space Odyssey? You know, what what is the big influence for you that you wanted to have not just your debut game, but then the follow-up to be about this kind of... Uh, uh, I, I guess crisis on a space station, and then this crisis on your way back to Earth. You know, you're dealing with dangerous stuff here. You're dealing with yeah. stuff that's been explored a lot in fiction. What's your attraction to it? I, I I've always loved sci-fi. I, I grew up loving it, and um, it was just I mean, lots, lots of Star Trek. Not so much Star Wars growing up, but in later life I have. Um, and but I just. I've always been drawn to it. I've read a lot of um, sci-fi books and watched lots of sci-fi movies. And it's just something that it's hard for me to find a sci-fi movie that I, I hate or I dislike. I've always got a bit of a soft spot for it. And therefore, for me to write something, even if it's only a little bit here and there, is relatively easy. Um, and it's, it's just something that I enjoy and I'm passionate about. And I'm doing this because it's, in the most part, it's a hobby. And so I want to do something that I enjoy. And um, hopefully lots of other people out there enjoy it as well. But I, as I said, theme is so important. It just it makes um, learning mechanics much easier. It makes them more memorable, more intuitive of what's going on. And it, it also it just makes it more fun for me. It gives me limitations in my design. Why am I putting this in? Is how is it thematic? How can I, rather than just chucking something in there, it's like, well, how can I make this thematic within the game? If it's not thematic in the game, then it can't go in because it just doesn't make sense. And if it doesn't make sense, it's not intuitive, which means people are going to forget it. So it's really, really great for boundaries as well. But um, yeah, I just, I just love sci-fi. It's, it's, it's great. <laughs> That's one of those things about games that people forget. They they oftentimes mix the terms, you know, like they, they view abstract and thematic as opposites. You know, you yeah. can have a very thematic abstract element of a game as long as your brain can kind of correlate how does this resonate in some way, even in an abstract sense. And I think that's one of the cool things about 
uh, where tabletop gaming is going is that we don't need direct interpretations of events or story sequence or or certain things happening, but still feel a real sense of immersion. I mean, if anything, that's what artwork has been about yeah. through the entire history of human civilization is being able to abstractly represent something like an emotion mm -hmm. and yeah. convey that whether it's in a visual or audio medium and i, I think that uh based off of everything that i've seen of assembly and sensor ghosts i i unfortunately haven't played either of them but everything that i've seen it even in the layout, the design, the way cards are arrayed, it conveys tone and emotion, and you know it it, it gives you a presentation to to immerse yourself in alongside the story, I think that creates a lot of resonance. And so I think a lot of people are definitely going to respond to this. And again, Sensor Ghost sounds like it could be an awesome prog rock album, so I'm all about it. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I mean, if you if the interestingly the um, the original idea of where I got the mechanic for um, Santa Ghost, so I'm not sorry, sorry for assembly. Um, so every time you run out the decks, so you go through the deck three times in assembly, and each time you get to the bottom, um, you have to shuffle up all the different bays, which is your basically what your ship has to look like, and you shuffle them up and lay them out again. And so I'm used to working on sort of engineering and projects where often the customer changes their requirements partway through the project. So the original story there is uh, basically the customer changes the requirement mid-project and then they change their requirements again. And that is exactly where the mechanic is. It is a real-life project going forward that you're so busy trying to get get everything aligned and put in the right place and then suddenly everything's chucked up in the air. But if you've completed stuff, then they can't change it. But anything uncompleted can be chucked up in the air and completely changed. And if you're lucky, some of it might land back in the right place again or some of it might fit what you've already done. But, um, yeah, that is actually sort of the where assembly came from. Um, and I thought that was a bit of a dull um, theme, so we went for sci-fi on top of it instead, which kind of kind of fitted as well. Um, but, yeah. And the rest is history. Well, yeah, exactly. I I'm so thrilled you came onto the show, Janice. Where can people find out more about Ren Games and Sensor Ghosts or Assembly and all the projects you got on the horizon? Uh, so we've got our website, which is rengames.co.uk, and that's Ren with a W, as in the bird, W-R-E-N. I'm on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at Dravin, D-R-A-V-V-I-N, or there's also at Ren Games, which you'll find on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you for coming on the show. And I can't wait to have you back on. Good luck with the Kickstarter. Thanks, Janice. Thanks very much. If you enjoyed this video, we have all kinds of other reviews, interviews, and recommendations via writing, podcasts, and video here on our channel and website, CardboardHerald.com. Our content is audience supported, so if you want to show your support, please visit our Patreon. Thank you so much for watching. This has been the Cardboard Herald.